the first limitation is long term, right? So we measure them after two months. What happens next? What happened after a half a year or a year afterwards? Um, we did not publish the long term results. However, uh, we did collect them, and this is under review right now. And but we will have the long term results published very soon in um, the scientific uh, reports journal, hopefully. Um, and we'll be able to learn on that, and that will remove this limitation that we don't have the long-term results. We have evaluated it more than a year and a half after uh, that, that when they completed this uh, trial, so a very long-term result. The next limitation, obviously, is sample size, and I think that's uh, a major limitation for any uh, big randomized control trial. It's very hard to recruit a lot of patients in, um, in a short time. The goal of this trial was to evaluate it, and if it's valuable, to deploy it. Because, you know, long COVID hit us all as the real pandemics. Um, you know, after the acute COVID goes, we have a lot of patients that suffer from uh, long COVID. And, you know, we have uh, 63 patients there. Um, obviously, we wanted more. Obviously, we if we had the resources, we would have had 200 or 300. But, you know, eventually, it's it's a matter of resources and what you are able to achieve uh, in a short period of time with limited resources. The other um, limitation I might think of uh, is obviously how to better select your patients. And I think that um, we were, were able to do analysis from that study was who's a better responder and who's a lower responder, you know? And again, it all comes to the brain imaging. So, like in any other brain injury that I'm treating, we are doing imaging-based patient selection. I need to see that the patient has the exact injury that I'm expecting that improves with my protocol. Because if it doesn't, then we're not dealing with the same pathophysiology and it's not going to be beneficial. It's really, really important to target the right pathophysiology with the right medical intervention. So I think um, on the randomized controlled trial, you treat everybody, but now when you are deploying it, you need to learn from your experience and to select the right patients that will improve the most. So we're talking about a chamber that people go inside of it, we close the door, it's a metal chamber, um, and then we compress air inside. When you have a closed box that's being um, pressurized, the atmospheric pressure increases. Think about it like an airplane or when you're underwater, the atmospheric pressure increases. Uh, in an airplane, it actually decreases, but when you're going down, when you're landing, it increases back. Um, and then once you hit the therapeutic pressure, you get an oxygen mask that delivers 100% oxygen. And the combination of pressure and 100% oxygen enables you to oxygenate your entire body in a very unique way. The reason you need both of them is a physics law that enables you to dissolve much more oxygen molecules in the body, in the bloody fluid, or what we call blood or plasma. Um, and you're only able to do it in a very high uh, atmospheric pressure. And the other thing I wanted to explain, if you do it in a specific protocol of what we do, meaning we go to a high level of oxygen, then to a normal level of oxygen, high level of oxygen, normal, what we call oxygen fluctuations, we are able to trick the body to induce specific mediators or molecules or triggers that trigger recovery or regeneration. Think about it as we're stressing the body to heal itself, to regenerate itself. We're triggering angiogenesis with the creation of new blood vessels, but we're also inducing neurogenesis, which is neural nerve cells regeneration. So again, by using a specific protocol with oxygen fluctuations, you are able to trick the body to heal itself or regenerate itself.